Welcome trustees, leaders of the university, students, faculty, staff, and friends of the university. I'm Tom Vogelman, Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and I'm delighted to see you all here. Welcome to the 2017 George D. Aiken Lecture. This lecture series is a permanent tribute to George D. Aiken, former Dean of the United States Senate and Governor of Vermont, for many years of service to the people of the state and nation. Founded in 1975 by George and Lola Aiken and supported by an endowment, the George D. Aiken Lecture is hosted at this university to provide a platform for distinctive views on critical American issues, and it is the University of Vermont's major annual public policy forum. The theme of these lectures rotate among George Aiken's three primary areas of interest in public service namely energy, agriculture and the environment, and foreign affairs. These lectures are accordingly hosted by the corresponding academic units at the university. So um, I would be remiss without making this announcement. Please turn off your cell phones. So for the introduction of today's lecture and our distinguished speaker, Michael Moss, I am pleased to turn the podium over to Provost and Senior Vice President David Rosofsky. Got it, you, know. you got it, you nailed it. Welcome. The University of Vermont, as you all know, is a global leader in food systems education, in research, and in collaboration. In fact, we are the first and the only U.S. university to offer bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in food systems. And here at the University of Vermont, we're passionate about making the food system more sustainable, more healthy, and more just. It seems our speaker this evening, Michael Moss, shares our passion. He writes on the food industry in the context of health and safety and nutrition, marketing, corporate interest, and the power of individuals to gain control of what and how they eat. Michael Moss is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the author of Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us, a number one New York Times bestseller and the topic of his talk this evening. He's currently working on a second book about food and addiction for Random House entitled Hooked, Food and Free Will. Between 2000 and 2015, he was an investigative reporter with the New York Times, reporting most recently on the processed food industry. In 2010, he won the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting for his investigation of the dangers of contaminated meat. His article on hamburger was the centerpiece of a body of work focused on surprising and troubling gaps in the food safety system. Before joining the Times, Mr. Moss was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, New York Newsday, and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in 2006 for his reporting on the lack of protective armor for soldiers in Iraq, and in 1999 for a team effort on Wall Street's emerging influence in the nursing home industry. He received an overseas press club citation in 2007 for stories on the faulty justice system for American-held detainees in Iraq. Mr. Moss is a former adjunct professor at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and has had fellowships with the German Marshall Fund and the Gannett Center for Media Studies. He's an occasional guest on shows like CBS This Morning, Dr. Oz, CNN's The Lead, ATC, and Jon Stewart's The Daily Show. A bit of housekeeping before tonight's lecture. Please record your questions for tonight's Q&A session after the lecture. Record them on the white cards found on your seats. These cards will be collected at the end of the talk. Now please join me in welcoming Michael Moss. Thank you for that. Wow. I heard you guys were a tough audience in Vermont. I haven't heard any booing yet, but I'm I'm still, I'm, I'll hold out hope yet for you. Um, thank you also to the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the 
Continuing and Distance Education. I love that name. I just wanted to say that. And the Aiken Board of, of Directors um, for, for hosting me um, tonight. And I've brought along, um, setting my timer, I brought along uh, my friend the Prezi here um, because it has these little Sherlock Holmes footprints wandering around here. Because um, for me, kind of crawling inside the world of food was like being inside a detective story. So I love the little layout on this. And I brought a few pictures for you too. And the story for me started in 2008 when I was in Algeria reporting on Islamic militants when a couple of FBI agents showed up at this place, the New York Times headquarters, looking for me. Um, for the previous few years, I had been running around Iraq tormenting the Pentagon for the, for the war in Iraq, and then the Middle East tormenting the Pentagon for um, the war on terrorism. And according to the FBI, somehow that had managed to land me on an Al-Qaeda hit list. I'm not sure that was the hit list I was on, but at any rate, the editors called me back to New York immediately, and I only mentioned that because I went from one war to another, that war, that war, to another. I was having uh, a meeting with my editor, Christine, up on the 14th floor of the New York Times, looking for a new subject to write about. And I think I was pitching her US arms sales overseas when she said to me, what do you think about peanuts, Michael? <laughs> and I go, ha ha, Christine, let me tell you about this arm you know, men factory. And no, no, she, they hear me out. There's been an outbreak of salmonella in peanuts, and thousands of people are getting sick across the country. And I'm still not getting it, so she goes, let me explain, Michael, right? This is the investigative group. We look for big, powerful stories. Peanuts, parents are giving them to their little kitties to make them healthy. This isn't junk food, and they're getting sick. These are being processed not in China, we can't blame them for this one, but right here in the United States. And they're being used as ingredients by this trillion dollar processed food industry about which we really know very little. And indeed, when I went down to Georgia and did some reporting on the ground on the factory, it became a story about that food industry losing control over its food chain because weeks and weeks were going by as the biggest companies, food companies in the country were still trying to figure out if they were using these particular peanuts in their products and recall after recall was happening. And my reporting on uh, contamination next took me to Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is Stephanie Smith, who I focused on a bit in the story because she was a dance instructor, taught children how to dance, went to her mom's house for a hamburger a Sunday supper, and a week later she was paralyzed from the waist down from E. coli contamination in the hamburger. And I was incredibly lucky to come across a trove of documents that allowed me for the first time to tell the story of a making of a hamburger that was tainted by E. coli. Um, and told, and in this case, it was a story about the meat industry intentionally losing control over its food chain and its ingredients in order to avoid trace back for costly recalls. And I was continuing to write about pathogens in food when I had dinner with one of my best sources in Seattle, Mansoor here, who tests meat for E. coli for the meat industry. And he said to me, you know, Michael, as, as tragic as these episodes of contamination are, you really should look at some of the things my industry, meaning the meat industry, is intentionally adding to its products, over which it has absolute control. He was really upset over salt in processed meats, which led me to think about sugar and fat as this unholy trinity, if you will, on which the processed food industry deeply relies on to make their products cheap, easy, and irresistible. Oh, it says that. Wait, that's not it. There it is. Yes. I'm oh, sorry. I have to. I have to laugh every time I see the cover of the of the of the book because, um, and you can you can see it here. The artist was a Russian in in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York, um, who read the book, got it, went into the supermarket 
pulled all his own favorite stuff off the shelf and ripped out the lettering and rearranged it to reflect what was really going on inside, um, which you can still see the tear marks there. And, you know, and, and the first thought I had actually in the book project was, look, I mean, we've always known that eating too much of the food, I like to call the food we hate to love, can make us sick and otherwise ill. And boy, was Monsoor right. I mean, obesity is now past, 30, past a third of all Americans. Um, last time I checked, 22 or 24 million Americans had diabetes, and another 70-some million had prediabetes. Um, uh, gout was up to like 8 million people in the United States, um, with huge sort of medical costs involved in that. Um, but again, I was incredibly lucky to come across a mountain of internal documents that put me inside the largest food companies as they were formulating, marketing, selling their products. And it was those documents that enabled me to identify key people in the industry who met with me and told me even more secrets. And the, the overwhelming sense you get from that material it's not that this is an evil empire that sort of intentionally set out to make us overweight or otherwise ill. This is an industry that's driving day and night to get us to not just like their products, but to want more and more of them. And as an investigative reporter, I'm obligated to follow the money, and obviously there's a ton of money sloshing around in the food industry. But I have to say, I really fell in love with the language that they use when they're talking to each other about their efforts to maximize the allure of their products. They don't have to use the A word or addiction, which they loathe uh, tremendously. They have words like craveable, snackable, right? And here's, here's my favorite, more-ishness. These are not English majors, right? These are bench chemists and marketing people, really sort of true to their heart describing, describing their efforts. Um, and through kind of those documents, I met great people, including this man, Howard Moskowitz, a, a legend in the food industry responsible for many of the big icons in the grocery store. In his words, he engineers products to be irresistible. He was trained in experimental psychology at Harvard, high math at Queens College. And he walked me through one of his recent projects for um, Dr. Pepper, in which he created a new soda flavor. As he explained to me, he started with no less than 60 versions of sweetness, each one just slightly different than the next one, subjected those to 3,000 consumer taste tests, took the data, threw it in his computer, did his high math regression analysis thing, and out came charts like this, which he sent to, to Dr. Pepper, with a bell-shaped curve, just like the ones you students are graded on, except that the top of the curve is not the dreaded middle C, it's the optimum of sweetness, not too little, not too much. And this is a really fine point that the companies try to hit. Anybody who likes sugar in their coffee? Well, you can do this test yourself. Just keep adding sugar till you hit that sweet spot and then keep adding more sugar and pretty soon you're gonna be going yuck. Well, it was Howard Moskowitz who coined one of my favorite terms, which was, ah, the bliss point to describe that perfect amount of sugar. And really, it's not that the food companies has, has Howard Moskowitz is working for them, engineering bliss points of sweetness for things like ice cream or cookies, um, things we know, or candy, Halloween, thank you, um, things we know are sweet, expect to be sweet, and can deal with as treats. The food companies marched around the grocery store adding sugar to things that didn't used to be sweet before, engineering bliss points so that bread started to have sugar added to it and a bliss point for, for sweetness. Yogurt came to have as much sugar per serving as ice cream. One of my favorite spots in the grocery store is, is the pasta sauce aisle where some of the brands had the equivalent of a, of a, of a half of, of two sometimes three Oreo cookies worth of sugar in a tiny half cup 
um, in a tiny half cup serving. And what that did was create this expectation in us that everything should taste sweet, which is a real problem, especially for kids who are little walking bliss points for sugar because their brains think sugar is the energy that their bodies, their growing bodies need. So when you drag them over to the produce aisle, which we'll get to later, and try to get them more to eat more of that stuff, that's why you have hell on your hands suddenly. And they didn't do just that though, but they changed the name of, oh, sorry, I did have to throw that in. Yeah, this wasn't that long ago, but this kid is now in college, and that kid's, you know, well on his way. I don't know where time goes. Um, they changed the name of sugar. Um, who can guess how many ways the food industry spells sugar? And don't just count these, because there's a whole bunch more. Any guesses out there? Take a wild guess. 60. Very, very close. Sorry, that's so small. 56 I counted anyway. There probably are four new ones just since I came up here today. <laughs> and it's not just sugar, of course. Ah, fat in some ways is even more powerful than sugar because it kind of sneaks up on you. Um, this is the word that the food industry des describes the, the, and it's not a taste officially yet. It's still classified as a sensation. And it's that feeling of biting into a warm toasted cheese sandwich because you have a nerve that comes down to the top of the roof of your mouth and goes to that same reward center of your brain that says, wow, love that. Let's have more. And you can probably tell I'm more of a fat guy than a sugar guy because my brain right now is thinking, yeah, that sounds really great. I'll take more of that. I'll take more of that too. Um, here's another question for you. We need, there's too many food people in here. We need like, a, 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 Chuck, what's your major? Business, yes. <laughs> Chuck is going to be our guinea pig here tonight. Would you please open that bag of potato chips? Put one in your mouth. I love potato chips. This is hard to give it away. And tell me, what percentage fat do you think that potato chip is? 20%. Chuck is low. Anybody else? The magic number for snacks and a lot of other foods in the grocery store for the fat content is 50%. And that hits that luscious mouthfeel sensation where that product will actually start melting in your mouth. <laughs> um, and speaking of melting, though, so we've got sugar, we've talked about fat. It's not just those ingredients. We'll get to salt later. It's not just those ingredients either. Um, the industry sort of is, is incredibly clever at other elements that go into these products. Did you know that the more noise a potato chip makes when it goes into your mouth and you crunch down on it, the more you want to eat that potato chip? You didn't know that? Well, they know that. And the potato chip makers even have machines that gauge how much noise the potato chip is going to make when it crunches down. But here's one of my favorite things for Chuck. Cheetos. We're coming back to some language here. This is one of my favorite terms. So please, Chuck, place that item on your tongue and press it against the roof of your mouth and tell me what happens to the item when you do that. It crumbles. It wasn't quite what I was looking for. You're even chewing, and chewing isn't something you have to do with processed food. You just kind of, it kind of melts. I'm thinking it kind of disappears. <laughs> All right. So they discovered that when you put an item like that in your mouth and it disappears, something amazing happens in your brain. Your brain thinks that the calories in that item disappeared as well. <laughs> and so you might as well, as Chuck is doing, eat the whole bag. <laughs> and they call this, <laughs> they call this the vanishing caloric density. 
again, bench chemists, right, being very precise about their efforts. Um, when I was at the Times, I was doing these little video snippets to try to reach out to people who didn't read the newspaper. Um, and I have a, a, just a little ditty to play for you here. Taco Bell's Doritos Locos Tacos, just released in its third iteration, is a marriage made in processed food heaven. It joins a perfectly engineered snack with a proven fast food colossus. This is Michael Moss, and I write about the intersection of food and marketing for the New York Times. And so I've been asked, what's in it? There are the ingredients, of course, but its real powers lie in what food scientists call psychobiology. That's the study of how the brain reacts to stimuli. The reason that Doritos Locos Tacos have been so successful, says food scientist Stephen Witherly, is because they are engineered to target taste buds using the most powerful features known to manufacturers. It has dynamic contrast. That's the pleasant sensation of biting through the crispy shell to the fat-laced filling. Taco Bell offers lower fat options, but the Doritos versions hit the mark for maximum allure. Half its calories come from fat, which gives it that craveable quality called mouthfeel. It has acids, lactic and citric, which get the saliva flowing and excite the brain's pleasure center. In turn, the brain says, go ahead, eat more. It has a long hang time flavor system in which the lingering smell stimulates food memories and cravings, and yet, this is the strangest one of all, it's forgettable. None of the many flavors in Doritos Locos Tacos are strong enough to trip a signal called sensory specific satiety that will cause you to feel like you've had enough. That's the point. They are designed to make you want more. That means more profits and more opportunity to live up to the translation of the Doritos name, Little Bits of Gold. There's something else. Catch carefully. That is something Chuck grew up on. Yes? Yes. The Lunchables. Wait, you don't even have to open it or taste it. You can take it home. <laughs> what I want you to do is look at the list of ingredients on the side panel. <laughs> Chuck, it's a long list. <laughs> All right. Which of those ingredients do you think are most important to get people not just to like Lunchables, but to go bananas over them? No, stop. It's not any of the ingredients. The most important thing about Lunchables is the marketing. And in fact, the CEO of the company who invented the Lunchables is sort of famous once internally for saying, you know, Lunchables really isn't about the food. It's about the empowerment that kids feel in the lunchroom when they open this package up and, and suddenly they're like the cat's meow of all of their friends. And that's when, um, that's when they came up with the marketing slogan, who remembers, um, yeah, I bet you can't eat just one. Everybody remembers that, potato chips. Well, Lunchables had, directed at the kids, all day you gotta do what they say, but lunchtime is all yours. And I spent a whole chapter writing about the Lunchables because I found the inventor who opened up uh, the documents to me and talked about how he did it, which is like totally fascinating. But also because Lunchables marked kind of the intrusion of fast food. Think about it, I mean, plain pizza, cold pizza crust and some tomato sauce and cheese you put on and anything else. They started making cold hamburger Lunchables and taco Lunchables and pancake Lunchables. The, the sort of the, the intrusion of fast food into the grocery store where people still kind of thought they were buying food that was good for them and it really, completely kind of changed the atmosphere in the, in, in the food store. One of my, um, speaking of marketing, one of my favorite characters in the book is this guy. Um, his name is Jeffrey Dunn, and for 20 years, he was the fiercest warrior at this company. He rose to become president of Coca-Cola for North America, South America. Um, Jeff Dunn walked me, sorry, the blurriness. Jeff Dunn walked me through um, Coca-Cola's 
pioneering of the supersize me phenomenon where you could go into a restaurant and get all the coke you wanted for the same price. The, the warlike language that they used with Pepsi, their competitor, in which they called their best cast customers, not their best customers. These are people who would drink two or three Cokes a day, but heavy users. And their targeting of kids uh, at corner stores like Tatiana here in Philadelphia, knowing that when a child goes into a store, and all the snack companies do this, um, knowing that when a child goes into a store and uses some of his or her own spending money and makes that first uh, purchase decision, that's words they use in business, you'll, you'll yeah, um, they will become brand loyal, uh, not just to the brand, but to the, to the, to the product as well. Um, and one of the most kind of powerful kind of marketing forces, which surprised me because I had forgotten, in the food industry was none other than Philip Morris. They didn't make French fries, but back in the late 80s, they bought the old company General Foods and then Kraft and became the single largest processed food manufacturer in North America for all of the 2000s, well, all of the 90s, did I say 90s? In the late 80s, they bought Kraft. All of the 90s into the 2000s. Um, and you can kind of see through the documents, the tobacco company documents, um, the tobacco managers at Philip Morris nudging and cajoling their food managers to, to use some of their marketing techniques that they use for cigarettes to sell food in the grocery store. But the big surprise for me was that it was none other than Philip Morris that privately turned to their food managers, this is in the year 2000, and warned them that they were gonna face trouble over salt, sugar, fat, obesity, um, just like the tobacco part of the company was facing trouble over cigarettes and cancer, and that the food division had to do something to lessen their dependence on salt, sugar, fat, or they were gonna be really in big trouble. And the other thing that happened too is that inside the companies you know, arose these cabals of insiders who also became alarmed about the growing responsibility that the food companies um, had over not just obesity, but even some kinds of cancer and et cetera. And there was this just journalistically fantastic meeting back in the late 1990s in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the old Pillsbury headquarters where the heads of the largest companies got together, were brought together by these insiders who were becoming alarmed about their culpability on obesity, et cetera. And the insiders urged the CEOs to do something collectively to turn the corner um, and start doing better by, by consumers with healthier food. And you can probably imagine what happened, but one of the most powerful people in the room, CEO at the time of General Mills, gets up and said, look, you know, excuse me, but I hear what you're saying, but you know, we are already doing okay by consumers. If they want a low fat version of our product, we're making that. If they want a low sugar version, that's on the shelf there someplace. But there is no way, because we are also beholden to shareholders, and there is absolutely no way we're gonna mess around with the company jewels, as he called salt, sugar, fat, um, if that's going to diminish sales. Which really has kind of got me, or takes me to the, to the final sort of of the of the ingredients, one of my biggest surprises besides that meeting and 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 just the whole the extraordinary science used by the companies is that they in fact are more hooked on using gobs of salt sugar fat in their products than we are in eating those and it really came to light to me um, when um, I sort of took a look at salt, which the industry calls the flavor burst. Because if we go back to that potato chips, the first thing that hit Chuck's tongue, which sent a signal to the brain, was in fact the salt on the surface of that, of that potato chip. And it's a very powerful hit on the reward center of the brain sending pleasure back to him. Um, but here's a really interesting thing about salt. Unlike sugar, which I mentioned kids are walking bliss points for sugar, we're actually not born liking salt. I guess that's a scowl, I don't know. It's been too long since my boys were a baby, but that apparently is a scowl and a baby. And it's not until about six months of age that we come around and we kind of start liking salt. Um, and so I went to the food industry and I said, um, 
uh, biggest companies, and I just sort of sent them a note saying, look, salt has become like this public enemy number one. It's links to heart, uh, high blood pressure, heart disease. Everybody's trying to cut back. Why don't you guys just like cut back on your products, or on the use of your salt? And um, Kellogg surprisingly raised its hand. Um, so I flew to Detroit and I drove out to, to Battle Creek, Michigan, where they prepared for me special versions of some of their biggest icons Except in this case, they left all the salt out to show Michael Moss why salt was so important to them. And we started, um, and we sat down. Um, oh, there I am going in, leaving all my electronic equipment behind, by the way. But I did manage this picture. These are the Cheez-Its that they prepared for me um, without salt at all. And normally... I could eat Cheez-Its day in and day out, which is why I'm not even going to hand these to anybody in the audience. Except I can't even open it right now. But without salt, we couldn't even swallow them because salt, they stuck to the roof of our mouth because salt um, adds texture and solubility. And we moved on to the frozen waffles, put them in the toaster, and they came out looking and tasting like straw because salt adds the color and the taste, and here was the, here was the best part. We moved on to the cornflakes, put them in our bowl, added milk, took a bite, and before I could say anything, the chief spokeswoman for Kellogg's was sitting at the table, and she gets this look of horror on her face, swallows, and she blurts out, metal, I taste metal, M-E-T-A-L, and I'm kind of thinking, boy, I'm glad you said that. I thought one of my fillings fell out and was sloshing around in my mouth. And when she said that, the chief technical officer, who's in charge of all scientific things at Kellogg's, he kind of chuckles a little bit and he says, well, that's really interesting. Not everybody will taste the metal, but one of the many people do. And one of the beautiful things about salt is that it will mask the off notes that, bad taste, that are inherent to some processed foods. Salt to us is a magical ingredient in so many ways. And then he went on to tell me about woof, which is what they call warmed over flavor, which is one of the biggest problems in the processed food industry, packaged foods industry, especially because when meat gets rewarmed, the fat in the meat oxidizes and gives off what the food scientists describe as the taste of wet dog hair. That's why they call, war and it's called warmed over flavor, but they pronounce it woof, right? Like the wet dog hair. Well, who can guess what the solution to woof wet dog hair taste in a canned vegetable beef soup would be? More salt, of course. Um, and who can guess how many types of salt the food industry makes to, um, to, or companies make to sell to the food industry in shape and texture and additives, if you kind of add it all up? Anybody want to take a guess here? 5, 12, 40, yeah, that was an easy one. 40 different types I counted up, um, which... Um, which is kind of astounding and again kind of reflects this kind of extraordinary science that goes into their use of salt, sugar, fat, which is much different than our use of salt, sugar, fat. I mean, don't get me wrong in any of this. I have, I have salt in my kitchen. I have tons of oil that I use, olive oil especially. Um, and, um, and when I make pasta sauce, I add a pinch of sugar because my mom always added a pinch of sugar. So, so there's nothing wrong about salt, sugar, fat in our hands. It's these massive quantities. Um, but things are changing. And here I get to a little bit of optimistic uh, part of the part of the talk. Um, there was a I mentioned the meeting back in 1999 in, in Minneapolis. It was a very different meeting a couple of years ago in Florida, where representatives of the largest companies went down and met with investors, right? who are asking them why they should keep selling their stock or investing in the companies. And one after another of the food companies was reporting dismal profits, earnings were way down. And the more forthright 
among those company officials, this was including the head of, of Campbell Soup at the time, stood up and said, you know, I'm sorry guys, but we are losing the trust of our customers. More and more people are caring about what they put in their mouths and that's being reflected in their purchase decisions and they are starting to not buy some of the most junkiest items in the grocery store. Um, and I had another incredible meeting. Uh, after the book came out, so it'd been about a year, and you kind of have to get to the, to the end where I write about hot pockets and describe them as basically being a poster child for the obesity crisis. Well, hot pockets were made by none other than Nestle, at the time the single largest food company in the world. I got a call from Nestle saying, hey, we'd like you to come talk to our private meeting of it was about 60 research and development people and on the shores of, of Lake Geneva where they have their headquarters. And I said, uh, really? They said, no, 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 hear us out. I mean, you know, we're now convinced that, that, you know, if we were responsible, as you say, for our share of the obesity crisis, we need to now become part of the solution. Um, so I went over there and I spent some time with their 350 PhD scientists. It's a really amazing operation they have. And, you know, to their credit, they're doing amazing things to cut back on salt, sugar, fat in their products. So now you can even get uh, a hot pocket that is, is much lower in salt, sugar, fat. But, but here's the thing. And it's a, it's a bit of a confession on my part, because as much as I've sort of harped about salt, sugar, fat, when you, when you go to a nutritionist, a smart nutritionist, and you ask them, what's the first thing you would advise somebody to do, a typical American, to do to sort of change their eating habits to eat healthier? The answer you get back is not reduce cut back on salt, sugar, fat. The answer I get back anyway is to double down on your vegetables. Fill up half your plate with produce, um, which kind of really surprised me at the time, but it's really true. Um, the government, very quietly, has been urging us to do the same thing, kind of to no effect. So I started to get the, you know, I sort of asked myself the question, what would my food giants do if they suddenly had to start selling stuff in the produce aisle? And the most cynical among us would probably say, well, they'd smother it in cheese sauce or caramel coating icing or something else that Chuck would love, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, but no, if they had to do it, just plain stuff in the vegetable aisle, what would they do? And I was sort of, you know, I became convinced that they would go back to their, their tried and their true. They would work on getting the cost down of stuff in the produce aisle. They would work on getting, um, they would work on, on, on uh, making it more convenient to use vegetables and buy vegetables and use them and prepare vegetables in the, in the kitchen because it is like really hard. But most importantly, I became convinced that they would go to their best friends, most powerful friends on Madison Avenue, and ask the advertising industry to come up with some way for selling vegetables like they sell Cheez-Its and potato chips and, and Cheetos. Um, so I got this really crazy idea, and this is kind of when I crossed the line from being a journalist to I don't know what, but I sort of said to myself, well, if nobody's hiring Madison Avenue to do an advertising campaign for the produce aisle, because it doesn't get any marketing, all the marketing is the, the, in the rest of the 90% of the store that sells all the packaged goods, why don't I try to do it? So it took a while, because advertising companies are really busy making a lot of money, but I finally found a company that agreed to do an advertising campaign for me um, on a vegetable in the produce aisle. And not only that, but to let me, inside their world when they did this campaign, film it, and then like write a story about it for the New York Times. And, um, and it wasn't just any vegetable that I asked them to do. I asked them to sort of do an ad 
advertising campaign that would wow people about what arguably is the most difficult vegetable for a lot of us. And here's, I just want to show you two snippets of the, uh, the video that we, um, we did of their advertising campaign. I do not like broccoli, and I haven't liked it since I was a little kid. And my mother made me eat it. And I'm president of the United States, and I'm not going to eat any more broccoli. Now. In spite of its well-known health benefits, broccoli is not a popular vegetable. It was derided by President George Bush, and it's pretty much ignored by the rest of us. I'm Michael Moss, and I write about the intersection of food and marketing for The New York Times. I'm trying to answer a question. What would it take to get people to eat better? The advertising firm Victors and Spoils, whose previous clients include Quiznos, General Mills, and Coca-Cola, took on the challenge pro bono. And about halfway through ever, they called me up and said, come on, uh, Michael, could you come in? We want to show you something. And I go, and they go, look, you know, you haven't given us any money. <laughs> We're not going to spend any money of our own. So we can't do like a real advertising splash or what have you. We're going to kind of like pretend to do like a social media campaign in, in, in like uh, Berkeley or Brooklyn or Burlington, somewhere cool like that. And, and um, just to kind of get people jazzed a bit. And we're going to pick a fight with another item in the grocery store. And I thought, oh, great. They're going to go after Cheetos or one of our other favorites. And they go, no, 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 no. You're forgetting your Coca-Cola chapter where you wrote about how the war, quote unquote, between Pepsi and Coca-Cola was in fact an entirely bloodless war because every time one of those companies came up with an advertisement that touted its product, all boats rose in the soda aisle. Um, it was good for everybody just to have attention be brought to one company. And they said, no, 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 hear us out. And so here's what they decided to pick a fight on for my little broccoli campaign. So our key consumer insight that we're working with is that everyone is currently talking about kale. Um, it is everywhere. This is Bon Appetit magazine. There's a whole section on the vegetable revolution in here, and there's a timeline around when all of these vegetables had their it moments. Broccoli is not on this list. There's nothing new or exciting to say about broccoli. Part of our challenge is going to be how to change the visual communication, the visual style of broccoli in culture. That wall over there says broccoli isn't exactly that cool. But maybe there's something cool of not being cool. Like you don't want to dupe anyone, but maybe, you know, maybe they're in on the joke. I mean, the fact that broccoli's having its own campaign, I think you could have a lot of fun with. The idea of like, you know, broccoli and kale. So you're basically saying like, I'd like you to live longer. Here's something that's going to do that. So in essence, broccoli is probably a better gift than flowers. Is it a brocade? Oh. No. Oh, you heard that. So. He said, is it a bro -K? This is how they get their juices going, these, you know, the, the, the artistic types on, in the advertising industry, um, coming up with sort of cracks like, like that. And the other important thing, though, I should have mentioned is that the very first thing they decided was there's no way we're going to talk about broccoli being good for you. That's what the government has been preaching forever. We're going to make it fun. We're going to find some way. Um, some way to sort of get people jazzed about broccoli without sort of hammering home the health benefits. Um, and so <laughs> I still laugh at this one. I don't know how I did this, but I talked the New York Times into putting this entirely fictitious uh, broccoli campaign on the front cover of the New York Times magazine. And inside were just a few of the advertising, fake advertising, that they would have done if somebody actually hired them to do this, that they were going to run, in this case, kind of picking a fight on poor Kale. <laughs> boy, boy, did I, and this went on and on, and I, boy, did I hear from the Kale people. I'm still hearing from the Kale people who didn't read the chapter on, they didn't realize their boat was going to ride, you know, if we actually ever did this. And that was it. The story kind of came and went, and I thought that was fine. I did my job and thanked the New York Times and blah, blah, blah. But then something really cool happened. Um, some students at Yale read the story, were excited about it, and took some of the loot that the advertising company had, like these 
great t-shirts and eat fad free, right? And they did a real advertising campaign. Um, New Haven is one of the biggest food deserts in the country. A lot of poor people live there, do not have access to good produce. Um, and they went into the few grocery stores that are there and did these billboards advertising, picking fun of kale and managed in their scientific study to double the sale of broccoli in a week or something like that. And then, and then one of the biggest broccoli growers on the East Coast picked up the campaign and started running with it and on and on and on. Their produce aisle is still having a lot of fun. I'll show you something a little later. The other cool thing that sort of has happened too um, is that some of the people I wrote about in the book have switched sides. Remember Jeff Dunn at the Coca-Cola company? Well, he quit and went to work for one of the two biggest farms that grow carrots and make baby carrots. And he was actually one of the first people who suggested to the carrot people that they could steal marketing ideas from his former industry to do that. Sell produce as stuff that's really sort of fun to do. Um, so that was kind of the marketing side. I mentioned that um, I think the food industry would also um, try to cut their costs, and I ran across farmers in the Midwest. Um, I don't know if you know, but most of the produce, most of the crops that we grow in this country are corn, but not the corn you eat, a corn on the cob, but corn for for corn syrup and ethanol and, 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 and animal food. Um, some of those farmers are now switching sides and starting to grow produce in the midland of the country, in some cases in greenhouse, so they can eat like us uh, all, all year long. Um, they're also fiddling with um, uh, the grocery store to make it more convenient and alluring to go into the produce aisle. We talked about this in a workshop earlier today, which was a, l a lot of fun, but, but basically there are, there are scientists practicing nudge marketing, trying to get people to um, remember who they are when they walk into the grocery store. Because everything about the grocery store is designed to get you to forget about yourself when you go in the door. That's why you have that soft la-la land music going on and the neon lighting and the layout of the store. So these scientists started putting mirrors all over the store in order to remind people of their body types as they went shopping in order to avoid what the supermarkets want to do, which is to typically get you to make an impulse decision, get you off your shopping list. Because um, that's where some of the extra revenue comes from that they, that they need in a very thin profit margin industry. Um, so these guys, oh sorry, these guys decided to, um, oh 7%, we are totally gonna make it. Um, <laughs> In order to remind people of their body image, <laughs> at one point they put, um, well, they did all kinds of crazy stuff. At one point, they took the shopping cart, nudge marketing, nudge economics, and, and, and put some duct tape down the middle. And in the front half of the cart, put a sign that said, put your produce in the front half of the cart. And just with that little nudging, people doubled their produce sales in whatever amount of time the study was. But they also did this. They put mirrors in the cart. This is a, a mirror reflecting the image of the guy pushing the cart. This is in El Paso, a place that has a real um, significant weight issue because um, they're getting hammered culturally from all sides. And um, he was funny because he goes, yeah, this is pretty good, but this mirror was kind of rectangular. And he goes, you should really turn it around vertically so I can see this part of my, because he had like a really big gut. So that kind of cool stuff is happening. Um, people are also trying to reinvent some of the, some, some of the most kind of awful corners of the, of the food industry, bending machines. There's this, this guy named Luke in Chicago. His first profession was selling lubrication oil to factories and he went into a factory that was making these things called uncrustables which were frozen peanut butter jelly sandwiches with the crust cut off and he said why would any parent give them that and they, they explained to him it's not parents it's the schools because they get rid of all their cooking equipment this is the only thing they can use these days and he said well i think i can come up with something better than that at least for vending machines and he got the idea of selling fresh salad in the vending machines. Um, this is one at O'Hare Airport. He's actually doing really, really good. And at one point, 
he reached out and got together with the inventor of the Lunchables to come to borrow, steal some of those incredible marketing um, tools and ideas that, that made Lunchables kind of so successful and apply those to schemes like this. Um, Protus Island's also getting its own advertising. People are doing really fantastic videos. Um, if this one plays. No preaching, and I have to say that's that's kind of working in my house too. I mean, one of the one of the things that's happened to me since the book is th is that I've started to kind of deal with the kids. Um, um, God, we forgot to, to open the Coca Cola. Oh my God! Well, <laughs> next time. Sorry, I know you're disappointed because uh, there is something really great in there. But okay, um, is not preach to the kids, but. Um, but have a conversation with them. And that's, for me, that's been one of the best things about the reporting experience is that I now go into the supermarket and look at these products and kind of like start laughing because I, I know what's behind them and why they're doing what they're doing on the front of the packages and why they're burying the rest of the stuff in the small print on the back of the package. And when you, when you do that with kids and don't preach, but kind of talk to them about produce in fun ways like that, or just have a conversation with them about seeing food as empowerment and seeing information about food as empowerment, you know, I think you get a much better, a much better reaction. And, and speaking of kids, these are college students in Saudi Arabia. They can't drive, but they started to, um, <clears throat> I, I, and I gave a talk there because diabetes is just running rampant in Saudi Arabia. It's like El Paso. They're getting hammered culturally from all sides. American junk food and, and their own customs of not letting women go to gyms and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they're now doing these projects where they're designing cool stuff where they're just kind of describing what's in some of the products and how much sugar goes into a, a, a soda, for example. Um, so there's really great stuff happening in schools. One of my favorite excursions uh, was going to a, a school in Rochester. It's actually one of the poorest schools in the, in the country where a middle school had a food project and they decided to kind of figure out all the stuff that went into their favorite foods. And in this case, they were really intrigued by color and how um, <clears throat> we are programmed to be more attracted to the brightest colors. Um, this is true in the animal world as well. Um, and then also to kind of think about how they would remake food um, that they loved in a better way uh, to reformulate it in, in, in ways that they would sort of still, they would still like it. Um, and I can't, um, and I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna wrap up here so we have time for, for questions, um, if you think you might have some, some questions. Um, and, and as was mentioned, I'm, I'm doing a next book about, it's called Hooked, it's about, it's about food and addiction because when, when salt, sugar, fat came out, the very first question I got from reporters was, was, so Michael, tell us, just how addictive is this stuff? And I was like, I was like, I had kind of danced, danced around that in the book because I really didn't know and I didn't know what the word addiction kind of meant. It means different things to, to different people and scientists and stuff. And so I decided to sort of spend some time um, crawling inside the heads of brain scientists as they're trying to figure out what food does do to our brains, going back to my food giants and trying to figure out how they are anticipating or dealing with the charge that they're designing um, addictive stuff, and then kind of looking at some other maybe even more significant issues that are that are going on that, I, that, I, that are not in the realm of addiction and I didn't cover in the first book. Um, but just to give you uh, one little tidbit, I ran across this the other day. I, there's, a, there's a point in Hooked when I'm kind of dealing with diets and dieting and diet foods and, and abstention because abstention and drugs is kind of the way to go. But it's, it's hard to do in food because you just can't stop eating, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult parallel to do that. But I, but I ran across... Um, just for fun, this item 
in the diet aisle of your frozen food section in the grocery store. Um, and going back to kind of the broccoli video, I thought this actually looked pretty good. Um, a lot of broccoli in that smart one. But who can guess, oh, and I should mention too, one of the fun things, I'm sure all of you know this, but when you turn a packaged food around and look at the list of ingredients, they don't tell you how much of anything is in that product, but they do list things in order. So the biggest item comes first, and the smallest item comes last. So it gives you a little sense, at least, of the relativity in the, in the, um, in the items. So you're going to be privately guessing where broccoli is on the list of ingredients in this product where broccoli is the very first item on the big print on the front of the package, which is the only thing most of us sort of pay attention to, right? Okay, here we go. There's like top 10 here. Is it number one? No, it's not number one. Number two? Any yeses yet? No, the cheese sauce. That was actually quite a few items in the cheese. I just boiled it down to one. Is it three? No, that was the modified cornstarch. Oh, no, it wasn't salt. Our old friend, the salt. Wait a minute. Wait, I don't see any. Do you see any salt? I, I don't even see any salt in that picture. All right, let's keep going. Five, no. It wasn't that. And actually, that was actually that when you, when you broke it down on the ingredients list. So that was sort of two ingredients. So we're, we're, we're up to seven or eight anyway. But no, technically six. No, that was a nada. No, that was that gum thing I can never pronounce either. <laughs> Spice. <laughs> hang in there, hang in there. We're going to get there. Spice, by the way, could be like a hundred ingredients, right? So like depending whatever they got in the factory to sort of put in there. I mean, that's a, that is a catch-all we could talk about later. Um, what about... No... Extract this. Wait, how far does this go? Do we have energy? Uh, no. Extract is a banato. Wasn't 10? Was it? Yes. <laughs> we got to the broccoli. It was the very last ingredient in that poor diet food. The upshot of which is um, you have to be careful in the grocery store, even if you think you're doing right by your health and your body, because um, uh, there, there are a lot of pitfalls out there. So thank you, and I, uh, I look forward to any questions that you might have. And I see a microphone um, here, or if you speak up, uh, you don't want to come up, I can probably... Uh, uh, repeat your question and um, do it that way. But it looks like the microphone's going to work, right? Would you, Jean, would you like that? It people works, come up? yes. So we're collecting the cards, but while we collect oh, the course. cards, I oh, get okay. to ask a question because yeah, I have not done that yet today, right? Even I with all of our cards, driving around, we got cards. So um, my question is related to advertising. So part of it is making these foods, and part of it, as you said, is getting the foods into us, right? right? So it seems that it has been impossible to get any kind of legislation, any kind of rules, any kind of you know strategies, aside from voluntary compliance by industry, to not advertise so much to directly to children. Right. So given that you're a journalist and freedom of speech, I'm sure, is like a thing, right? So that's what they say, right? It's freedom of speech. We can do what we want. Do you ever see a day when we can limit legislatively advertising to children? So it kind of falls in the category of any action that the government can take to kind of coerce the industry into doing things. I'm, I'm a little discouraged that we're going to see anything along those lines, a regulation of any sort that's going to squeeze the industry a little bit. And I'm much more, and I'm much more kind of interested in this idea that people which led to this, in the industry's view, this horrific meeting in Florida two years ago where they had to confess horrible earnings, that um, people make changing their purchase decisions to buy healthier stuff 
will send the message to the industry that they have to change. And so by pure economic drive, they'll, they'll advertise the junkiest stuff less than they will the other things, which so would just be a fantastic It's up to way. us, again, to do it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we can force, we can compel them to do it. Right, right. Okay. Do we have a good question? Um, Okay, we know that these large industrial food companies use a number of marketing tools to get consumers to buy their products. So, what are the most successful, productive marketing tools that drive consumers to buy healthy food? Right, so I think, that, I think part of that is in the broccoli campaign. I think part of it is thinking about how do we, how do we sell produce to people without seeming like we're preaching? Can we make it fun? Um, and in a way that will kind of speak to kids. And I think that's been the best thing that people have kind of come up with um, to date, which is stop already with the preaching and let's entertain and let's make kids laugh and then maybe hopefully they'll come to, they'll come to, to Broccoli if a bunch of other things happen to Thank you for doing this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let me see. Sugar seems to be in everything, even in my Kashi Go Lean cereal. How can I try to stay below 25 grams per day as the American Heart Association recommends? Ooh, I I know. Put your dietitian hat like, on now. I think that's just like really, really hard to do. I mean, I, look, there are, I mean, people who really need to seriously lose weight will keep diaries of what they eat, and I can't imagine doing that and and or even looking at the fine print on all the products I eat I mean I think the surest way to do that is just to sort of minimize the amount of packaged food that you that you eat and try to go for staples with you know a bit of cooking I mean one of the things I started to to, to do more was make my own pasta sauce um, which <clears throat> you know you buy a can of tomatoes if it's off season and you add whatever a couple of spices are in your cabinet and a little garlic and and saute that up and you add the tomatoes in five minutes you have a really great pasta sauce for less money and you don't have to add kind of the tons of, of salt or uh, in some cases sugar that they do with that so either you have to painstakingly design a you know a diet program for yourself having studied uh, the nutrient facts boxes on all the items, or you just kind of start steering your 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 way toward eating kind of basic stuff and away from it, and give up convenience. I mean that's the thing. So the these foods were convenient, and we we're paying a price for that convenience that that the companies, of course, didn't didn't want to tell us about. Um. Do you anticipate litigation similar to, to the tobacco litigation? If so, is it likely to be successful? Mm. Yeah, I kind of get into this more in the, in the, in the next book. Um, but I think the short answer is there's a pretty big difference. Um, I, and I can't tell you, I don't think the food companies are too worried about that. Um, um, because when it comes to a jury and when it comes to tobacco kind of has little redeeming value other than calming you down, but, but it's not like food. And the problem with a lawsuit against the food industry is which of the 60,000 items that are sold in the grocery store are you gonna pick on? And how would you possibly link that item with any one person's sort of health problem? Because there's nothing inherently wrong with with Cheez-Its, it's the amount of Cheez-Its and the amount of sort of those kinds of foods that we've come to be dependent on as an issue. And, and then you've lost your, your, your um, defendant mm -hmm. yeah. when it's the whole industry. <clears throat> um, when I go to the nutritionist, the other piece of advice I get is to eliminate processed foods altogether. What made you choose to work with these giant companies rather than speak outright against them? Um, what made me, I'm sorry. To what made you work with the companies? With them. So what? demonize them versus working with them. Oh, right, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, are, you know, is there, I think just kind of having more of a practical view. I mean, it's for many, most of us, 
we can't just dump processed foods. And I'm kind of not about, about, about arguing that we should just totally abandon processed foods, um, but rather controlling, trying to control them rather than sort of let them control us and use them to some extent. And people just can't, I mean, many people just can't, don't have the, the resources, the time to do that kind of shift over from processed foods. So I think I'm, I think I've just been sort of trying to um, be a little more practical minded about that. Um, and at least just to give people the facts. I mean, if, if reading my stuff is, convinces you that you do, you are going to make that, that move to completely abandon processed foods, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. that's, your, that's, your, that's your decision. But there, I think there are ways that other people can, can, can work with them and control them uh, in, in ways that we don't know. Um, this individual worked at Kraft Foods Philip Morris from 86 to 96 and now works in the addiction field <laughs> for drugs and alcohol. There is research that indicates that you can delay the age of first use. It reduces the likelihood of addiction, delaying the age of first use of drugs. Um, is there similar research for food? If so, who funds it? <laughs> um, yeah, delay use. Um, Boy, I haven't seen, I haven't seen that in particular. I mean, there are studies about whether, you know, if you raise your kid never to eat Oreos, what happens when they go to their friend's house right. and they get Oreos for the first right. time? Are they going to pick out more than yes. they would otherwise <laughs> or, or less? And I think those are all pretty inconclusive in part because there are kind of so many other, so many other issues um, going on. But that's a, but the delay thing is really interesting too, though, because one of the, and, and I'm talking about the next book now, and I shouldn't, but one of the most powerful things in food um, is memory. And uh, memories are even more powerful uh, the younger you are when you have those memories, especially kind of in the, in the early teen years. Um, so uh, so, I, I, so I, th I think that that person probably has a point there mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. Um, why did the industry cooperate with you? So what's in it for them by talking to you, knowing what your intention was, maybe? Yeah, so, you know, as an investigative reporter, basically it's your job to, um, <clears throat> to um, do things that, that kind of coerce them into cooperating with you. And in my case, um, I had their documents, and I had their people. And I, and I had a mission to be fair and thorough um, and accurate uh, in, in my reporting and a reputation for doing that. So I think that while, I said this earlier today, while they wished, they probably wished I was never born, having been born, I think that they felt I gave them a fair shake. Because um, the book isn't a screen, it really is more of a detective story. This is how they did it. Um, and I'm not telling you it's necessarily bad, you can, you can know that for yourself, this is just uh, this is how they this is how they did that, and I think that I think that they felt that. Besides the fact that within these companies, you know, are these cabals of insiders who totally agree with with many of you, I'm sure. Um, and we're cheering me on, sort of privately. <laughs> <laughs> how did kale become popular? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good. So I had to look at that at one point. Yeah, so they didn't have like an advertising company. Um, the answer is nobody knows. It was one of, the, and people looked. It's like one of the, there would be a good research project for a nice university student, you know, any of those. Um, but apparently it was just kind of happenstance. There was a, I think there was an actress who started talking about it and there was a little bit of social media stuff that exploded. And the kale people were obviously nuts about it, and it just kind of, it just kind of took off on its own, on its own without any help from Madison Avenue. But well, that's about the only one in the produce aisle that's had that luck. I know. I just want to say that I show the broccoli ads in my class, and they're fantastic, and <laughs> the students don't laugh. So <laughs> I was really happy tonight that all the adults laughed because I think they're hilarious, and they right. just sort of sit there and. Oh, laugh. interesting. I know, yes. Well, that's. That's the challenge with advertising, too. You've got to know who your audience is. And if you're targeting that at kids and they're going to laugh, then you're know. obviously making what a mistake. What can I say? <laughs> so we have any more? I think that's it. So I can, ask, I can actually ask this one. This has nothing really to do with the talk, but um, is the New York Times really failing? <laughs> <laughs> 
you would right. know, right? <laughs> so what are the latest? So, so advertising is gone, um, or, or, or substantially. Um, the print side of the business is disappearing. The digital is increasing. Um, and I guess I would sort of leave it to you as readers whether you think the paper has the stature that um, that it that it that it used to have. I mean, it's hard to we're in this kind of you know period right now where it's really kind of hard to judge because there's so much crazy news out there that that it's almost like you don't even need investigative reporting. For example, it's just there's stuff just landing in your lap that's just like unbelievable. Um, so it's definitely having some hard, hard times as the whole media is, and um, and it's and it's kind of dicey as to uh, where things are going to go. So we're out of written questions. If anybody has the energy, we've got a few more minutes. You're welcome to come up and ask. Well, so you're going to make me run back there with the microphone? Is that what you're going to do? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to hand you the card. Yes. Anybody else? Question? Hi there. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm over here. Hey. <laughs> I hate Sorry. that feeling. Um, so I have a question about this. I'm doing a lot of work on food ethics, moral mapping of the food system. And um, as we do that, we pick out ethical issues and try to rank them. And one of the things that's come up a number of times is the ethics of replicating the same kinds of manipulative marketing techniques for better foods. Right, um, good one. And what the role of manipulation ought to be in an ethical food system. Right. So uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, do, the, do the ends justify the means and like tricking kids over to, into the produce aisle? Um, no, I have no idea. I have no idea about the ethics. I mean, you know, the bottom line for journalists is, I mean, you shouldn't lie uh, and you shouldn't like mislead, deceive them. Um, do we ever lie to our kids to get them to do something good? I mean, that's a really, that's a really kind of tricky place. I would be more concerned about it backfiring, though, <clears throat> not worrying about the ethics, but having the kids kind of see through it and running the other direction and it just kind of failing. That would be my, that would be my first concern. But the other issue ethics too is, you know, should produce need marketing? I mean, really, should we apply, you know, the the truisms and the and the the, the tricks that Lunchables did to uh, to produce? And I think that's a really good question. And I don't, you know, I don't have the I don't have the I don't have the answer to that. You might have an opinion. <clears throat> Grooming. Oh, right. So, right. So her answer was if we sort of pitch, you know, broccoli to them like junk food, it's a real thin line as they get older to hearing pitches about junk food then. And maybe if those things are, maybe we're playing right into the hands of the, the junkiest stuff in the, in, the, in the grocery store if we do that. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a good fear. Hello. Hey. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for your talk. My question is in the transition from getting people eating processed food, what they're comfortable with, to eating more fresh vegetables, we've forgotten how to cook. Yeah. And, and how, how are we going to get people cooking? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, sort of, I had this dream once of taking um, a zip code someplace, like the Bronx or whatever, and doing like 20 things in that zip code to sort of help people change their eating habits. And one of the things would be to put a garden in the school to get people, not to, not to feed the cafeteria necessarily, but to get kids excited about food. Um, you know, and then they're going to come home and get all excited about radishes and tell their parents about radishes. And then you've got you to find a way to get radishes in their stores so their parents can actually buy the radish when they go shopping. Or maybe, maybe you would get one of the home delivery companies to start delivering to that. So, so part of the answer is there's all tons of stuff you have to kind of, kind of do. And, and one of them is, in fact, cooking. Um, 
and I, I write about the demise of the home economic system of uh, teaching a uh, curriculum in schools in salt sugar fat, or, or rather the shifting of it, where girls and boys to some extent were taught how to shop and cook and be and, and be mindful of, of food and food preparation, um, and and kind of the curriculum shifted to more you know, pressing matters like pregnancy or getting a job out of high school. Um, and um, yeah, and if I was like king for a day, and this is starting to happen in some jurisdictions, it's starting to come up with programs that teach kids how to cook in kind of a political way. Um, because these are kids who've never been to a grocery store before. Some kids don't know about utensils because they're eating things that come in wrappers that they can eat with their hands. And starting to sort of, as part of that, starting to cook um, cook as well. But teaching food kind of in a political way, which is, you know, here are the companies wanting you to do kind of what they want you to do. And here are we, and do we have any power to decide for ourselves? And sort of see it in that framework as well. And in a few places it's been tried, it's worked really well. Again, it's not preaching. Um, it's it's talking about food as 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 power that I that I think could. So the shorter answer is, you know, kids. We got. I mean, I think we have to start with the kids. I think I think older people like me are hopeless, um, are much harder at any rate. I'm not sure that all the cooking shows are even helping either. That's a, that's another subject, but usually important cooking. Um. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. So you, oh, sorry. Hi. Hi. So I work for a, um, a large food retailer, and we, yeah. yes, and yeah. Um, I'm working inside the company to try to persuade them to sell healthier food. And what I hear is that we're kind of addicted to junk food ourselves; that we kind of can't get off of the agreements that we've made with these giant food mm. retailers. What do you think a big food retailer should do to try to, you know, because I feel like we already influence what our shoppers buy by selecting the foods that we sell to them. Right. So I feel stuck, and, and I want to persuade them to do the right thing and the right, right. thing for our business. So, um, well, if, if there's some agreement that the produce aisle is a great place to start, I mean, I think that there probably are some nudge marketing things that stores could do to get people to spend more time in the produce aisle. And I, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have Wegmans here. I love what Wegmans does. And it, they were started by like a couple of produce hustlers and then they became like a supermarket. But if I'm not mistaken, half of the store is the produce aisle. And they, they, they do cooking demonstrations to show you how to cook asparagus or cut an artichoke if you've never done that. And they also, they also make produce more convenient so you can go in and buy a tray of freshly cut and assembled vegetables to take home and throw in your wok and cook, which saves a lot of time. And probably food waste too, I would suspect. So um, knowing that, and here's the real thing that, that got me when I looked at the guys in El Paso, when they did their uh, grocery cart thing in El Paso to steer people toward the produce aisle, um, they immediately got some, some regional food chains really excited. Um, and they told me, the food chains told me, the reason for that was that the produce aisle is actually really profitable for them. I mean, except for having labor costs, because you, you have to manage the produce. You can't just sit there, um, and it goes bad. But um, it's really profitable. They kind of set the prices, which is a good and a, and a, and a bad thing. But, um, but as a profit center in the store, there's a built-in economic incentive for them to kind of push the produce. So um, um, even stores like Walmart, though, started experimenting. Um, one of the things that soda companies did was they started putting coolers at the checkout stands, knowing that our uh, shopping list falls apart most when we're waiting in line to, to pay. And those impulse to purchase decisions happen at the checkout line. And so Walmart started to take those or their own refrigerators at the checkout line and fill it with produce, which is like kind of cool. And other stores have thought about putting displays, you know how there's displays of potato chips like all over the store on the, on the end caps which people see a lot because they're walking by that part of the store, um, the ends of the aisles that face into the, the main 
the main corridors, um, they kind of like started putting produce there that fits the products around there. So avocados near the chips, that kind of thing, kind of integrating produce. Maybe that doesn't work, yeah. But I guess that would be, that would be the first thing I would do. And the other thing, produ uh, the other thing Wegmans has is a this this kind of health employee kick thing going on, right? Where they're they're really trying to nudge their employees into getting blood pressure tests and and spending more time thinking about their own healthiness, sort of in the, thinking that will then rub off on on everything in the store. So yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, yes, and thank you so much for your no, no services. Problem. Free food, you know, nothing Love better than free food. <laughs> um, so you said a lot of our reliance on processed food is the convenience. Yeah. Um, there's In the last five years, there's an emergent industry of meal kits, um, yes. those meal-to-delivery kits. Uh, right. It's like a multi-billion dollar industry. Do you foresee the food system and the food industry shifting toward that? And if you don't, do you think it would still kind of help quell all of these issues that come along with it? Yeah, I think, th you know... Boy, I'd be scared to invest in a meal kit, kit company because uh, company, there's like a hundred of them now, all sort of fighting for a piece of that market, which is, I'm not quite sure where that, that market's going to go. Um, we tried Blue Apron in my house once, and I was surprised at how much work it was. Um, just reading all the fine print on the recipe card and sort of doing it, which was fine. I mean, I do, uh, my wife works outside of the house long hours in Manhattan, so I'm, I'm doing most of the cooking in the house. Um, and I have, you know, my own recipes, basically. But I, I did Blue Apron with my 13-year-old, and we were just kind of surprised that it wasn't totally easy. So I think there's a, there's a whole gradation of those meal kits from difficult to easy that maybe people are. But, but I think they get, a, they get at a really big issue, which is the hardest thing about cooking for me is um, is thinking of things to cook, designing a menu that doesn't get boring in just a week, and, and week after week, right? And then shopping, like going out and getting all that stuff and bringing it home. That That's the big time consumer for me. And so the meal kits sort of tend to sort of solve that solve that problem. I don't know, what do you think? You're, the, you're a business major. Um, I'm actually, I'm doing a project on it right now, so I've been learning a lot about it. Yeah. It Definitely, I mean, it gives you a whole meal. All the food is naturally sourced, but a whole food. Right. Albeit the price point's kind of high. It's about 10 to $11 per person. Right. But Blue Apron's kind of right in the middle of that. It's like the, the most is about 8 the heavier goes to 12 Right. Um, they're having a lot of issues with their operations constantly. Food, like the food contamination. I can imagine. And that would. growing so rapidly that at deployment, the OSHA is all over them constantly. So right. It's, it's at a very right. Scary. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, of course. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good read. I look forward to your paper. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Okay. Hi. Um, I am curious as to why when you look at the ingredient list of any grocery item, you see grams, you see percent daily allowance, except for sugar. Ah. Sugar has grams, right. but no percent daily allowance. So I'm curious as to why and what is it? So the Food and Drug Administration is in charge of that. And I went to them at one point and asked that question. And they said the science isn't strong enough for us to put a cap, which might mean that they think they wouldn't withstand a legal challenge from the companies in court, which which may in fact maybe be maybe be the case. Um, but you're right. There's a big hole on sugar, and you have to you have to go to you know groups like the American Heart Association to get advice. And it's pretty shocking the numbers they have. Thirty-two right? grams American Heart Association. Thirty-two grams for men, twenty-eight for women. Right. That is what is that? Half of a soda? I think that's that is yeah. not very of added sugar. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think according to them, if you're if you're having a couple sodas a week, um, there's some evidence that you're you're sh you know significantly shortening your life or or, or whatever it may be. So, um, you, but I have to say, you know, the nutrition science generally is is real tough for journalists to deal with because 
it's hard to do, and it's really hard to do is find quality studies because you just can't take two groups of people and put them in a lock them up in a room and 20 years later come back and see how they did, eating a lot of sugar or not. It's you know it's it's not easy to do that stuff. So yeah. Do you know the difference between broccoli and boogers? Broccoli and what's the second? Boogers. I don't. No. Boogers. Right. The difference? Kids won't eat broccoli. <laughs> That's a good one. I know. Okay, I'm, now I'm going to let you make a That'll shameless work. plug for your next book. <laughs> Tell us when your next book is coming out and you're done. Well, uh, I don't know when the next book is coming out. I'm almost, I'm almost done with the rewriting and so... Hopefully next year, we'll see. Okay, so. okay. Thank you. Excellent talk. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.